And he made for them coats of skin and clothed them and sent them forth from the garden of Eden. And on that day was closed the mouth of all beasts and of cattle and of birds and of whatever walks and of whatever moves so that they could no longer speak. For they had all spoken one with another with one lip and with one tongue. And it makes mention, you know, as I said previously, um, that they were speaking in Hebrew, which is the Edenic language of God. And we see that in Zephaniah, that at the end of days, we will all be returned to the knowledge of Hebrew and will speak in that language again. Rob? Yeah, anybody that's ever owned pets can probably, if they, you know, if they took the time to love their pets, can tell that they do, they are self-aware they mm -hmm. they have emotion. They can think. They they are aware of their surroundings. They get depressed when they when you leave. They get real happy when you come back. Mm -hmm. They feel pain. Um, they they have the full range of emotion that we have. Um, and and birds have always intrigued me. Um, growing up, we had parakeets uh -huh. in our house a lot, and we've had several that had extensive vocabularies like you could have a conversation with the bird oh, that's so cool and my my grandmother my mother's mom uh after uh, her husband died my grandfather died you know she was alone you know for, for quite some time and she's a talker she was somebody that could really sit there and talk and talk and talk and so she got a bird and as a consequence of that the bird had a huge vocabulary <laughs> and you know, when we'd go there as kids and whatnot it, you could have a conversation with this parakeet I mean, it's, so cool. it's a, you know, I don't know how big the brain of the parakeet is, but it's not very big. And yet it would understand what you're saying. And it, you could actually have a conversation with this bird. Like it was it was bizarre, freaky. Um, and my ex-wife, when I met her, she had a parrot, a much bigger bird that had a uh, I wouldn't say a, a nearly this vocabulary the parakeet had, but it had a pretty decent vocabulary. And it, it got very jealous of me and you, it would literally like verbally torture me. <laughs> like I'd be sitting there working oh on, uh, I was working on a VCR one time. I was trying to fix it and I was really trying to concentrate and figure out what was wrong with it. And Frankie was the bird's name. The bird's off to the side going, what you doing, huh? What you doing, huh? What you doing, huh? I'm like, shut up. What you doing, oh huh? What you doing, huh? And like, I'm like, shut up. <laughs> like it's driving me crazy. And so uh, my, that now so my funny. She says, just tell him what you're doing. And I'm like, I'm working on the VCR, Frankie. He goes, okay. <laughs> okay. He left me alone. Like, like these things, they have intelligence, you know. They, 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 and, and Frankie, like, would literally plot out ways to get me. Like, he would think about things. There was one time I was sitting there again working on something, and, uh, and I saw him out of the corner of my eye. He's kind of going sideways across the cage. Like, like, what's he doing? He's going sideways across the cage. Well, he was lining himself up because, you know, I bent over and, and I bent back. And just as I bent back, this turd went flying right by past my nose. Oh, <laughs> my goodness. He was lining up oh to, to on me. Like, and he, <laughs> he's off to the side shooting it like. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, that like, is so crazy. You know, I've had you know, all kinds of animals and they are smart. And they can communicate, mm -hmm. yeah. and they can understand whatever you're. You know, in our case, it's English, but they can understand the native tongue of whoever's there. And of course, we have Balaam, the the donkey that right. that God decided to open up the donkey's mouth. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're talking like Shrek, right? right. <laughs> donkey, donkey. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. The donkey starts talking. So you know, I'm of the opinion that all of God's creation, all of His living creation is proportionately intelligent for the task that he put him put them here to do. Mm -hmm. uh, you just sit and watch ants. You know, if you ever watch right. an ant, like, I mean, they got an ordered structure. I mean, they, they are thinking creatures, mm -hmm. you know, doing stuff. And that's why, like, I won't kill anything unless I absolutely have to. Yes, like, yes. I don't see a reason to do so. Like, I, right. Sheila freaks out about a bug or something. I'm the guy to go get a cup, put a, you know, index yeah. Or Good take it outside. You, you know, I just there's no point in killing it. Yeah. You know, um, especially since I I believe that they have a nefesh. Yes. You know, and you. so you know, it's <laughs> it's just something to think about. You know, for people to mm -hmm. consider. Anyway.
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I um, have the same tendency to respect the life uh, of everything here. And really that, you know, in this world, we all have this lifetime and we're all aging and dying and we're only going to be here for a short time, uh, according to the greater uh, dynamic of creation and, and life and being and eternity and um, all of that. And so I try to respect, you know, the life of everything as well and to assist uh, where I can, you know, if, if you find the insect drowning in water or whatever to, you know, why not go out of your way to try to help if yep. you can, uh-huh. you know? Yeah, and that uh, that video I referenced earlier, uh, it's it's interesting. It's a guy with like a, a British accent uh, reading a document that was sent to you know apparently it was written in like I said the ninth century at some point, and so this, the person who did this video is like reading the letter as if he wrote it, you know, mm-hmm. um, and he, the the whole question is do these dog men dog headed men have souls, and you know, listening to this guy's rationale. It's like, well, okay, they wear clothes, so they're aware of modesty, and so this shows an intelligence. And like, I mean, he's he's going through this whole rationale, you know, for these things. And this is an interesting topic because we are in an age where you know we're talking about animal human hybridization nowadays in the news and stuff like that. And there's a book by let me see, I can pull it out here, uh, John Darnell. It's called The Gospel to Every que- Creature question mark and he's not necessarily talking about going out and you know preaching to a horse or something Um, but what he addresses in his book is this issue of animal human hybrids and can they be saved and specifically in the context of like the darpa super soldier type stuff like what happens to a guy that joins the army let's say goes into maybe the special forces and finds himself you know part of a elite team that goes through some augmentation let's say Uh, by blending themselves with animals, um, can they be saved? And he's of the opinion they can. And and I I don't want to speak for him, but it, I, from what I gathered, he's of the same opinion that I am. That a nephilim is not just uh, um, just angel human. That it's anything that has been corrupted from the original kind that God created. Uh-huh. So you, like a centaur would be a nephilim in that case. Right. Yeah. Uh, just as much as an angel human, an animal human would be a Nephilim. So the question often comes up, you know, are, can the Nephilim be saved? Well, th- there's no indication that they want to be in right. most cases. Yeah. Uh, but if they did, like you do have confederates of Abraham that appear to be good giants. You know, Mamre, Aner, and Eshkel mm-hmm. um, teamed up with Abraham, uh, I think when he was still Abram, uh, regardless, you know, Abraham. Uh, to get Lot back when the, the, the after the Genesis 14 war, mm-hmm. and so you have Amorite giants that teamed up with Abraham, and then when when Sarah dies, it says that he's negotiating with a dude named Ephron of the Hittites for a burial plot for Sarah. Well, mm-hmm. the name yeah, Ephron, yeah, the the name Ephron means fawn like. Oh, so, uh, I, you know, I was looking at the text and looking through it, and he was a Hittite. Well, the Hittites had lots of drawings of animal-human hybrids, uh-huh. including many uh, what we would call satyrs, you know, half, right. you know, fawn-like beings, half goat, half humans. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I'm looking at the text and looking at the history of the Hittites and going, Whoa, it looks like Abraham's negotiating with a satyr for a burial plot for Sarah. Mm, that's interesting. Um, and it was uh, Danny Duvall who um, said it best, I think. He said, wherever the spirit of man is with a heart of repentance, salvation is possible. Yeah, I agree. And that's that's what I come to is like, yeah, you know, the animals in and of themselves, I don't believe need salvation. They didn't mm-hmm. they didn't sin, which is right. why they were used for sacrifice, because for whatever reason, in God's economy, you know, he requires blood um, and you, the innocent, you know, uh, mm-hmm. pays for the guilty. So you had innocent animals being killed uh, in sacrifice and then finally the the lamb of god himself came yeah. to be the final sacrifice which means i don't believe we need to keep doing animal sacrifices anymore. i agree um, i think it was all just to lead up to the coming of christ and to show a type in the shadow of what he represented and how he would be you know the final 
sacrifice as God incarnate into flesh and dying on the cross to bring a forgiveness of sins to uh, the world. Yeah, I, I, uh, I mentioned Dr. Russ Hauck earlier, and, you know, he's a Messianic Jewish person, and he, when he does Passover, he does, you know, it says on the, you know, take a, a lamb, keep it for four days, you know, and then kill the lamb and eat it. Now, people get all upset about that and, you know, oh, you're doing animal sacrifice. Look, he's talking about killing an animal and eating it. That's no different than all you guys bragging about, you know, the deer you shot this weekend. Right. You know, the, the flesh you ate earlier today. Yeah. Anything you bought from the supermarket, you know, <laughs> yeah. killed and eaten. So, you know, Chris Pint, uh, Putnam tried to make a big deal out of it because I did an interview with Dr. Russ Hauck and he explained what he does for Passover. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Chris spun it off to Skiba's out sacrificing lambs and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and he's, this guy's his mentor and all this crap. That's oh, my gosh. For me. But uh, it, that's not something I'm I'm so thankful that Yeshua was her final sacrifice. Yeah. Because that's not something I would be capable of doing. I yeah. just I, and, and Russ, you know, he's a, a big uh, teddy bear, soft hearted guy himself. Mm-hmm. And he said what it did for him was it showed just how precious the Lamb of God was to his father. Yes. That you know, he acts like, you know, as a human caretaker father, if you will, to this precious creature for four days, and then he has to kill it and then eat it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're not used to that. We, we're we used to going right. to the supermarket. Yeah. And somebody else did all that stuff, right? Um, yeah. And so, you know, for him, he was like, it, it just tear, it tore him up. And I think that was the point in the beginning, uh, certainly. The, it, it, we were supposed to care for these creatures. Uh-huh. And when, when you care for something and it, and it has to be killed, you know, I mean, I've had to put dogs down because they were, you know, in lots of pain and cancer right. and things. And you grow up with this pet like you're like a sibling. You know, you love this thing and then you have to kill it because it's suffering. You know, it, that's a difficult thing. And mm-hmm. I think that was the point is that it was meant to show us there's a high price for sin. Yes. Yes. But Absolutely. I think men just got to the point where, Oh, you know, I could do anything. I just got to kill a bull or, or a lamb or, you know, whatever, you know, no big deal. So life became cheap. Mm-hmm. You know, I could go on doing whatever I want. I just go kill this dumb animal. You know, um, I, I think we missed the point. And right, right. You know, when Russ was telling me the story of when the first time he did a Passover that way, I, I, I lost it, man. I couldn't hold it together. And he was yeah. like, you're just hearing the story. He said, I had that right. there. And, you know, it, it showed him the intensity of the sacrifice. And when you think about what God did with his only son, yeah. uh, and and even more so that, that Yeshua is like, yeah, okay, Dad, whatever. You know, I'll do it. Right. Like, pff, wow. Yeah. Wow. Exactly right. And, you know, I think... Um, it really shows the the sanctity of life. And then also, you know, in the early, um, back in the ancient times, they they raised their cattle, their flocks, you know, and the, the story of how you, you go to find that one lost sheep, the love that you have for the animals that you are in care of, and how God and Christ being the shepherd and we are the flock, just how much he loves us, you know, to even offer up his own life to bring us uh, forgiveness of sins and to guarantee our salvation through him. I mean, yeah, I, I often, in reading, you know, the stories of Christ, I, I'm just taken away by the Spirit and, you know, led to, led to tears over um, just a comprehending the profundity of the sacrifice that he made for us. And uh, so... Yeah, it is... Mel Gibson came close. Yeah. Um, but I even even what he depicted, I think, paled in comparison to the magnitude of, right. of, of what took place there. And, like, I'm reminded of it in somewhat simple ways. Like, early this morning, I was not paying attention and I stub my toe like really hard. And if you ever stub your toe, man, I mean, there's something about your feet that just, it hurts, man. Like, yeah. it, like it was, but every time I do something like that, I just think, yeah, imagine what a spike going through your feet was like. Oh you know? my goodness. And then having yeah. to 
every time you exhale, you've got to push yourself up on something that you're already hanging on. Yeah, to try to catch that, your breath. That, 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 what a horrific, <sighs> just horrible form of execution. Mm-hmm. And well, you know, I was looking at that whole because I was, I was like, okay, if he if he had to die for our sins, why did it have to be that way? I mean, there are mm-hmm. plenty of ways to kill a person. Right. Why that way? And it was uh, Steve Mutria did a teaching on uh, nailed to the cross, powerful teaching, and he talked about the cup of bitter waters. That if a husband suspects his wife of of committing adultery, there's this ritual that the the wife would drink this bitter water, and if she was guilty, mm-hmm. then her thighs would waste and her abdomen would swell and there would be all kinds of problems that she would deal with as a result of the consequences of it. Um, if she was innocent, nothing would happen to her. Of course, right. she would punish her husband probably for the rest of his life for making <laughs> her do that. They um, made Mary and Joseph go through that. Oh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. I was not aware of that. Um, yeah. it, makes, it makes sense, though, yeah. that that would be the case. Um, and so what, but what uh, Steve was pointing out is that Yeshua became the sin offering for us. So he took, we always say he took on the sins of the world, right? He took on all our sins. Right. Well, he was, he said, I only came from the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, Israel was divorced. He's trying to win his bride back. And the way he did it is the bride had to die. You know, the husband mm-hmm. had to die. The bride had to die. It was like kind of a, a dual thing. If you look at Deuteronomy 24 and what he did there. But if you think about, he was crucified at 9 AM and was dead by 3 PM. And that's the time when they were killing the lambs on Passover. Right, exactly. And so, and, but the priest, the high priest, had rent his garment. Well, Scripture says, you know, if you do that, you just nullified your priesthood. So he had to stay alive during the entire time that was taking place because there was no legitimate priesthood mm-hmm. right there. Like the, the, the high priest was no longer a high priest. He had rent his clothes. And so he was being the lamb while being the high priest at high the same priest. time. Exactly. Yeah. You know, uh, in the order of Melchizedek, as we see right, later. Right. Um, and he was suffering as the lamb during the entire time that the lambs, you know, the physical animals were being killed from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And uh, what one scholar was talking about was when he said it is finished, probably another way of looking at that is more like, Okay, you know why am I still here? You know it's done. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, uh, it was a Dolby stereo kind of scenario when the priest on the altar in the temple had s- sacrificed the final lamb. He said it's finished. At the same time, the lamb on the cross said it is finished. Like mm-hmm. mind blown. Like yeah. oh, it's like but he literally, and in the process of that long drawn out form of execution, his thighs wasted away and his abdomen swelled. Like oh, wow. Ex- exactly what happens in crucifixion is what happens, you know, biologically speaking, to the woman that uh, partakes of the drinking of the bitter water. So when he wow. said, may this cup pass from me, you know, I've always taken just this cup of suffering, which, yeah, that's true. Huh. But it, it took out a whole new meaning to me. If he's about to become the adulterous bride, literally, right, right. then he literally took on the punishment of the adulterous bride. His abdomen swelled, his legs, thighs gave away, and his he liter- his heart literally exploded. Like, wow. just, yeah. Just, I can't, man. I, and I don't even think that captures everything, you know, when you just right. think of the right. magnitude of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, deeply touching. And, you know, again, for those that are disciples of Christ and that are reading the stories, um, especially there's a, a text called the Gospel of Gamaliel, the Lament of the Virgin and the Martyrdom of Pontius Pilate. And it's about 100 plus pages. And it's a story of the passion uh, of what Yeshua had to go through during those days. And it covers the passion in greater detail than any other text that I've read. And even the... Um, you know, the resurrection and how they knew the the Pharisees. Everybody knew that prophetically he had warned and told them that he would rise on the third day. And so that's why they had um, set a guard and appointed, you know, these soldiers, the Roman legion to mm-hmm. to protect and to try to prevent all that happening. But they couldn't. You know, it was all prophecy. Mm hmm. Yeah, is it the the gospel of Nicodemus talk about that uh, also? 
Yes, it does. And actually, the Gospel of Nicodemus and the Gospel of Bartholomew are the two texts which go into the descent of Christ into mm. Sheol and how he had freed. Because the promise was made to Adam uh, in the first book of Adam and Eve. He tells them that after 5,500 years, he's going to mm. come down into the flesh, be born of a virgin, and that dying on the cross, he would descend down into Sheol and bring liberty to the captives. And that was fulfilled. That prophecy was fulfilled. And, you know, according to the feast days, he was resurrected on the 16th of Nisan. And that was the day that the high priest does the, the wave offering, the barley sheaf offering for the sins of Israel. And that's also the day that uh, he took Adam and his descendants back up into paradise and presented them before the father as the first fruits of the resurrected dead. First and then, death. yeah, and then they were baptized in the Arturusian Lake by Michael the Archangel and allowed to enter into New Jerusalem, the city of God, which again, I believe is above the vaulted dome of the earth. And that's why it tells us that it, it is from there that New Jerusalem will descend, that it is the home of the righteous. And at the end of days, uh, it will come down, the, the firmament will open like a scroll, and then the uh, New Jerusalem will descend out of the heavens because God will tabernacle with us here on the earth for the millennial reign. Yeah, that was one of those other things that just, for me, as I started looking into biblical cosmology going, wait a minute. I mapped out, you know, you look at the dimensions of the New Jerusalem, whether you think it's a pyramid or a cube, either way, the base mm -hmm. is the same. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it looks completely ridiculous on a ball. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's so huge. I mean, it's like a teeter-totter deal. <laughs> right. It's just so big. <laughs> that, that, I mean, that thing would have to literally, like, really embed itself pretty hard and fairly, you know, not fairly, deep. quite deep, quite yeah. deep earth for all the edges to be touching the ground if it's to sit down on you know and, and a spinning ball at that i mean you end up with yeah, like right. the jack-in-the-box logo you know for, for, the, for the earth you know waddling right. out this big thing sticking out the side of it so yeah, yeah exactly it <laughs> oh man yeah it's so funny <laughs> Yeah. Well, hey, brother, we've got just a few minutes remaining. So uh, if you would, can you, uh, I'm sure many people are familiar with your work, but uh, give out your website, contact information, and, um, you know, final comment. For sure. Yeah. Uh, well, robschannel.com is sort of the hub that will take you to everywhere else. I've got a lot of websites out there. Um, Seed the Series being a big project that I'm working on. A big shout out to my supporters out there. Thank you guys so much. Uh, lots of positive movement going on there um we uh, the my attorney's supposed to get back to me he was supposed to get back to me today he didn't call me yet so uh assuming everything's good with the contract that'll probably be signed maybe tomorrow and awesome. we're in production next week if that's the case so wow fantastic brother big yeah Congratulations. huge thank you to our supporters out there this is a a lifelong dream for me but also at 10 years i've been working on this project in november it'd be 10 years so uh, yeah, very excited about all of that, <laughs> uh, needless to say. So, bad. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Yeah, to finally see something that you've been so passionate about and so um, preoccupied with work on coming to fruition like that. Because I know when I finish a book, completion is just what a <laughs> wonderful feeling, you know. Yeah, it's a, a euphoric uh, feeling, you know, you know. Uh, the visions for the appointed time, you know, uh, and it feels like now is finally the time. And I'm glad that it's taken this long because mm -hmm. the amount of research that I've been able to do since 2009, <laughs> like, whew, so much, the, the story is so right. much bigger now. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And lots of new people that I've met along the way, of course, uh, are going to help, you know, as well. So very exciting. And Man, we finally got through chapter one, dude. Like how, it was amazing. eight hours. It was right. uh, eight hours took us to get through chapter one. Whew. Yeah, it's a lot of material, a lot for people to consider. And so, looking forward to you know going through the rest of the story, especially with the the beguilement, uh, 
and also when we get to the book of Enoch in Genesis 6, wow, Dude, so we'll, much there. At, at this rate, we'll have no shortage of topics to talk about <laughs> for probably a decade. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I agree with you, man. You know, right, well, yeah. Uh, just saying, I'll be on with Rob next Wednesday evening, and we will continue this journey. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We appreciate all of you. Be blessed. Thank you, brother. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. Good night, all.